Mary Jane watched from behind hospital glass at Peter's Aunt May. When Peter called her, MJ explained that Aunt May was still in intensive care and she'd fallen into a coma. She was being kept alive thanks to their machines, as they hoped her body would eventually recover enough to take over from there. But they also said that the family should be prepared for the worst. Peter tried to convince himself that his Aunt May would make it through like she always does. He wondered if he should be there with her, if there was anything he could do. But according to MJ, all they could do was wait for now. They wouldn't even let her in the same room as Aunt May. So MJ told Peter that the best thing he could do for her right now would be to deal with anything he needed to do and get the people responsible for shooting her. There wasn't anything to do at the hospital besides cry. Peter agreed and promised to check in whenever he could, telling her that if there were any changes at all, then she should call him immediately. MJ then asked Peter if he was okay. No, I'm a long freaking way from okay, MJ. But at least I've got something to do. Otherwise, I think I just rip my own eyes out. One thing's for sure, though. You're gonna see a lot more people being taken to the hospital before this day is out. As he swung across the dark city of New York, Spider-Man thought to himself that the only lead he had was a list of four black market gun dealers that don't like to disclose the identities of their customers. But he knew he could fix that. And he did so very, very quickly, making light work of several goons. Now he'd made it to the last one after breaking into his penthouse and catching him in his PJs. The dealer tried to feign ignorance, but Spider-Man just threw him into a wall. You sell guns intended for one thing only, to kill people from far away because like you, the people who buy your garbage are cowards, afraid to get too close. So you live up here with the rich folk, high above the ground where your guns are used, while the cowards who buy from you fire at innocent people from across the street. Expecting Spider-Man to try and turn him into the police, the dealer called his bluff, wondering what he was gonna do since half the country was looking to arrest the so-called hero. But Spider-Man wasn't feeling very heroic right now. He reeled back with a man in hand and flung him right out the window. The criminal cried out in horror as he plummeted several stories before a bit of webbing latched onto his foot. As he barely hung there, Spider-Man appeared again, wondering if the man wanted to ask the same question again. When he didn't, Spider-Man started asking some of his own, along with any relevant names. The dealer did exactly as he was told. The first two names belonged to rich hunters, but the third name? That was the name Spider-Man was looking for. Jake Martino, a freelance hitman that was willing to take on the jobs nobody else wanted. That meant the hit wasn't personal. Someone hired him. The dealer said Jake had friends in high places, making him untouchable. But Spider-Man didn't care. He needed to find him quickly before he left the city. While some police officers were dealing with a homeless man who'd peed in an alleyway, they soon realized that thanks to Spider-Man's webbing, they were now trapped there. Spider-Man did this so he'd be able to borrow their car and access their records. It took a while, but eventually he had everything he needed on the hitman. But when he got to the guy's place, it was already too late. The entire apartment was clean. After having one of his windows broken, the landlord came to see what was going on. Spider-Man apologized on account of being in a hurry. But considering this guy also saw Spider-Man fighting alongside Captain America during the superhero Civil War, as a veteran himself, he was willing to look past it. With that, Spider-Man asked where he'd be able to find Jake Martino. Apparently, the guy made his escape about half an hour ago and was headed to the train station. This immediately made sense to Spider-Man, since an assassin like Jake wouldn't be able to go to the airport with his tools. And just like that, Spider-Man leapt out the window yet again, much to the landlord's displeasure. But as Spider-Man swung away, he also added that two other guys were just looking for Jake before him. Spider-Man's best guess was that whoever hired him was looking to take the shooter out too to make sure the hero couldn't find out who ordered the hit. That just made finding Jake all the more important. Making his way to Grand Central Station, Spider-Man wasn't sure how he'd find the guy when he doesn't even know what he looks like or where he's going. As he swung inside in front of several civilians, he knew this was his only chance. Seeing as the guy tried to kill him and his family, Spider-Man's best shot was showing himself like this and looking out for a big reaction. And with any luck, that reaction would be enough to trigger his spider sense. The crowd of people just looked at the darkly suited vigilante as he looked around, concentrating intensely. And just then, his plan worked. Spider-Man found his prey. He was happy to see the killer immediately start running. He wanted him to run. As the assassin unloaded a clip from his Uzi, Spider-Man thought about how he wanted the man to know what it feels like to be hunted, to feel cornered, to feel outgunned, to feel doomed, to be a dead man walking. Jake quickly swapped weapons, but it was too late. Spider-Man made him drop it by breaking his arm. Pick it up. You've still got one good arm. Go ahead. No, I said pick it up. Spider-Man removed his mask. Not so easy, is it, when the other side fights back? Not as easy as shooting an old woman through a window from across the street, is it? He viciously punched him in the face, sending the man's glasses flying. 
You shot her! You shot my aunt! The hitman began to beg, but Peter threw him into a support beam, telling him to shut up. Martino didn't show any mercy, so why should he? You're a coward. The worst kind of coward, who hides behind the telescopic lens and fires from cover. Afraid to show your face. Afraid to look your victims in the eye. Peter then told the man to look him in the eyes and tell him what he saw. But when the man didn't speak up, Peter decided to make it clear. Tears filling his enraged eyes. I'm going to kill you. After you tell me who hired you. Tell me now and I'll end this fast. Hesitate? Drag this out? And I'll show you depths and levels of pain you've never even dreamed of. He could tell Martino was going to give up the name. But then, he felt it. Several gunshots rang out as he jumped out of the way. Martino fell unconscious as the perp ran off. Peter immediately threw a tracking device in the direction of the shooter and thankfully managed to get his boot. As some officers rushed in, Spider-Man knew that there was always a chance the shooter would discover the tracker and take it off. But he also couldn't afford to lose Martino in case he woke back up. Latching onto the ambulance that kept him, Spider-Man asked himself if he was really prepared to kill the man for shooting his aunt. The answer was clear to him. Yes, he knew that in another time and place, he would have been ashamed of that answer. But not now. Not today. But it was clear to him that the universe was still capable of dramatic irony as they pulled into the same hospital where Aunt May was being cared for. A part of him was offended by the thought of the same hands being used to keep Aunt May alive being used to do the same for a guy like this. But another part of him could see the symmetry in it all, and approved. And just then, MJ called out to him. She was worried about him, but he was more interested in Aunt May's condition. But it wasn't good. She wasn't gonna make it. As they held each other, Peter played the words on repeat in his mind. Coma. Life support was all that was keeping her alive. It was only a matter of time. A matter of time. Elsewhere, Jake Martino was officially pronounced dead. A sniper was killed from a distance by another guy with a gun and good aim. Again, the symmetries were just piling on at this point. Peter assured MJ that things would be alright. As long as Aunt May was still alive, they'd get through this and somehow save her. Just then, Peter felt the proximity of his spider tracer. He knew it was time. A man was on the phone, giving an update on Martino's condition, assuring the person on the line that their target didn't get the chance to talk. He'd ask if there was anything else he needed to do, but was interrupted. Peter shot his webs over the man's mouth while telling him to be quiet. Then he took out the phone as the person on the other end confirmed that it was his idea to have the apartment cleared out. As Peter secretly listened in, the man tried to tell his minion to lay low for a while. It was only a single sentence. Peter immediately recognized the voice. Hello, Mr. Fisk. Well, hello, Mr. Parker. And what may I do for you? Just one thing, Mr. Fisk. You can die. I can die? Mr. Parker, let me explain the world to you. I don't die. I have some who do that for me and some who do that because of me. But I don't die. It would be a violation of the laws of nature, Mr. Parker. Peter responded by saying that in the last 48 hours, he'd broken just about every law possible. As he lifted the red-suited goon by the neck with one hand, he didn't see the harm in breaking another. He explained that once he pulls off the webbing, he was expecting to hear everything the man knew about the guy he just shot. After harshly ripping it off, the man tried to say that he didn't know anything, but Peter wasn't buying it. Don't lie to me. I can hear your heartbeat. It goes faster when you lie. Lie to me again and I'll pull it out of your chest and show it to you. That wasn't really true, but this guy didn't know that. He admitted that all he knew was that Kingpin wanted him dead because he knew something the boss didn't want anyone else to. The terror in his eyes let Peter know he was telling the truth. He vowed to kill anyone directly involved in the shooting. This guy was clearly just another person being used by the Kingpin, but he still needed to send a message. But as he heard MJ's footsteps, he realized he couldn't tip the guy off to where she or Aunt May were. So before she would make it out to find him, Peter was already swinging through the city while holding the killer by the ankle. Back at the prison, one of the guards in Kingpin's pocket came to check in on him. Disregarding the guard's banter, Fisk clarified that he needed a favor. The guard was willing to do anything as long as it was within the rules. Unfortunately for him, Kingpin couldn't abide by that, as he stood and crushed the wooden legs of his table with his bare hands to expose several wads of money. They'd be going far beyond the rules. The guard looked on in horror. When I first arrived at this place, there was some thought that I might be stuck here for a very, very long time. So, I made sure that there were ample supplies around should they ever be required. Another leg was broken. You see, in ancient times, it was not uncommon for a king to be kidnapped and held hostage until a fee worthy of the king was paid. More money emerged. And, well, in an environment like this, a man such as myself must be prepared for any eventuality, however unlikely, including the possibility of someone making just such a move. Fisk now had a bundle of cash almost as big as him. 
He wondered if the guard knew what he had in his hands, questioning if the guard knew what it was called. Stunned, the guard eventually answered. It was a king's ransom. Fisk agreed with him, although he made the distinction that a king pin's ransom would be too much to fit in the cell. Because his attorneys believed he may be released soon thanks to some new negotiations, he didn't need the money anymore. Instead, he was going to buy something with it. He wanted the guard to share some of his newfound fortune with the other guards on the night shift. However much they needed to simply look the other way at some point tonight. He suggested that the guard take his wife on a nice long vacation, maybe somewhere like Switzerland. Taking the money, the guard wondered what else the kingpin wanted. Now holding the bars to his dimly lit cell, Kingpin explained that when he was taken to this place, his belongings were stored in the holding lockers downstairs. He wanted the guard to bring him his clothes. With a smile, he was prepared to send a message. Meanwhile, hanging upside down in total terror and begging for his life was the man Peter grabbed, who was apparently named Jim. As a pack of angry rats crowded around his dangling body, Jim cried out and Peter began to ask if he understood the food chain. Perched upon his own webbing, he offered to explain. The food chain consists of two parts, predators and prey. Predators? Well, I don't think I really need to explain that, do I? Predators feed on prey, and we may define prey as something incapable of defending itself in proportion to the attack. A deer against a wolf, for instance, or an old, defenseless woman against a man with a high-powered rifle. At this point, the rats were all over Jim, prepared to become predators themselves and begin eating him alive. Jim begged desperately, willing to do anything Peter wanted. To suddenly interrupt them, Peter threw a trash lid, destroying the web and dropping Jim into the sewage. Tell everyone, tell the people you work with, tell everyone in the whole wide world that my family is off limits. That nobody, nobody touches them for any reason ever. Tell them, make them understand that anyone who tries moves to the bottom of the food chain and becomes prey. And down here, in this food chain, the rats aren't the predators. The men with guns aren't the predators. I am. Later that night, he went on the hunt yet again. The prison was quiet, but just then, all the lights turned on. Before long, all of the cell doors opened up, and countless inmates flooded out to see what was going on. Meanwhile, William Fisk received his package. He proudly lifted its contents as Spider-Man lurked outside. He made himself decent as Spider-Man made his descent. The vigilante crawled on the walls. He evaded the guards' notice, but they clearly weren't making an effort here. Fisk spared no expense when it came to his image, and Spider-Man wasted no time making his way inside. A fully suited kingpin was then seen strutting out past his fellow inmates. Standing at the center of it all, he confidently stood as a loud crash rang out. With a crowd of criminals as witnesses, Spider-Man appeared before his longtime foe for one final showdown. End of the road, Fisk. You, me, right now. Kingpin towered over him with a smile on his face. Admittedly, he would have preferred a better place for the grand finale of their long association. Something more regal or even gladiatorial. But at least this place came with a very appreciative audience. Spider-Man stared him down, saying nothing. Kingpin frowned. He wasn't used to Spider-Man without all the jokes. Making a show of things, he pointed out that all around the room there were some of the most deplorable men in the world. But even they all looked down on a certain type of person. A chump. To him, a chump was someone who foolishly believed in the greater good. Expecting good to triumph simply because it is good. Someone that trusts the government, his fellow citizen, or even a man in an iron mask that says, Show the world your true face, Peter. It'll be okay. And what they all saw was the face of a chump. A chump that was now being haunted by the people he believed in. Spurned by the system he supported. Abandoned by his so-called friends. Had his wife living in a two-bit motel and his sweet old aunt dying in a hospital bed because he couldn't even stand still long enough to take the bullet that was meant for him. His smile expanded then. But I guess you can't make an omelet without breaking a few old ladies. Spider-Man had enough. He unleashed a flurry of blows to Kingpin's face faster than the crime lord could react before suddenly leaping back. His face bruised, Kingpin's expression was different now. His anger reflected in Spider-Man's visor. Kingpin composed himself, hoping to control the flow yet again. Even his usual sense of humor and devil-may-care attitude seems to have abandoned him. 
must be terribly distressing and unfortunate to have absolutely nothing left in life except the desire for revenge. Which is especially unfortunate since once you've made a mockery of everything you stand for and victimized the woman you said you loved, really? What's left except humor? Again, Spider-Man unloaded a barrage of unrelenting fists, all aimed at Fisk's face. And yet again, Spider-Man stood back. Bloodied, Kingpin studied his mortal enemy. He was apparently unimpressed by Spider-Man's cheap theatrics, believing the vigilante was hoping to confuse or wear him out. Again, Spider-Man said nothing. Kingpin was pissed. Well, you said you were coming here to kill me. Are you here to fight or dance? Say something, damn you! Spider-Man agreed to do so. He explained that this black suit stood for something that Fisk could never understand. That it represents a promise about all the things he said he would do, and all the things he said he would never do. All the lines he said he would never cross because doing so would destroy everything Spider-Man stood for. And that was why Fisk was confused. Spider-Man wasn't here to kill him. He began to peel away the mask and costume altogether. Peter Parker was here to kill him. And just like that, he rushed into action yet again as Kingpin prepared a fist of his own. Peter drew blood as he crashed into Fisk's oversized jaw with the crowd roaring. But as Peter pushed his enemy's nose in, he didn't hear them at all. As he broke the reinforced concrete with Fisk's body, there was no crowd, no jokes, no cute remarks, no acrobatics, no webbing, no tricks. As he kicked, there was only one thing on Peter's mind. His boot crunched on Fisk's face as he thought about how this was the man responsible for the bullet that tore through one of the two people he loved more than life itself. As he viciously beat into the downed inmate, he corrected himself. As he forced his blow into Fisk's trachea until he spewed blood, he knew that this wasn't a man, it was a target. Peter flung his target across the room, looming over him. Peter explained that Fisk had forgotten something very important that he should have remembered before he decided to put a bullet through someone too old and frail to get out of the way. That for all his money, cruelty, and big talk, he didn't have any real power. He couldn't fly, stick to walls, turn into living flame, or stretch out across a 20-foot room. At the end of the day, you're just a fat man with an attitude. A balloon just waiting for someone to stick a needle in it. And me? I'm the needle. Kingpin cried in rage as he reached for his enemy. Peter ducked, dodged, leapt, and evaded before cracking the villain across the face with enough force to knock his teeth out. Kill you! Swear to God, I'll kill- Get up, Fisk! I said, get up! Go to hell. I'll get up when I- I- Can't- Peter lifted the 450-pound man with one hand by the flesh of his chest. One slap. Two. Three. It was unending. Peter then held his prey aloft by the blubber. Balloon. Needle. Now, here's how it's gonna happen. Peter lifted his hand to Kingpin's open mouth. I pour a stream of webbing deep into your throat, your esophagus, all the way down into your lungs, filling them completely. The only way to remove it surgically would be to cut out your lungs, which could not possibly be done before you die from lack of oxygen. I turn your entire respiratory system into one big solid chunk of useless tissue and webbing. It takes three seconds. Peter began the countdown. One, two, three. The horror and fear in Fisk's eyes were on full display, but much to his confusion, Peter lowered his hand. Then he threw the tyrant into a wall. If you're going to kill me, get it over with. Oh, I will. I said I was going to kill you, and I am. But I didn't say I was going to do it today. Peter admitted that he'd learned something from Fisk about cruelty and timing. He knew that he'd done something far worse to Kingpin than just kill him. He'd beaten him. And on top of that, everyone in the room saw him do it. And they'll tell their friends, and those guys will tell their own, and on and on. Soon enough, the entire city, no, the entire country, will know what Kingpin already does. That he was beaten in public one on one. And for a man like Fisk that needed everyone to believe he was unbeatable, this was the worst pain imaginable. Peter wanted him to live with that fact, because he knew it would tear the crime world apart each and every moment of each and every day. He wanted Fisk to burn in the hell made just for him, at least for a little while.
Peter admitted that he'd always tried to avoid killing anyone due to a combination of his own principles and fear of how it would affect his family if he did. If Aunt May were to die, that would take care of one reason. As for the other, he was willing to make an exception. Then he leaned in real close to give Fisk a breakdown. The exact moment Aunt May dies would be the moment Peter resumes his hunt, and they'd finish what they'd started. And as of right now, Fisk knew there was nothing he could do to stop it. Peter would arrive, and then he would count. One, two, three. And then, you'll be dead. I swear to you, on my life and her soul, on everything I hold dear, you'll be dead. In the meanwhile, Fisk would live in the memory, humiliation, and message of this very moment. Then Peter turned to the other criminals and everyone they knew. If anyone comes near him or his family again, if anyone even touches them or anyone else that matters to him, they'd experience this same treatment firsthand. You touch them, you die. Painfully. Slowly. Definitively. Peter shot out a web while telling the downed kingpin that since he ordered Aunt May's death, it only made sense that his life ends when hers does. So he suggested that Fisk try and convince God to give her every possible second of life. But as he left the scene, He'd add that in Fisk's position, he wouldn't count too much on God. See you around, Mr. Fisk. Count on it. All of the inmates looked at Fisk. He barked at them as he got up, but they didn't waver. The fat man then limped his way to his cell. The kingpin has been defeated. Check out these videos for more dark Spider-Man stories.